the devil awakens. Maximus wrests his life from the underworld. Hey boy, what in the world are you doing here? He was elated with his escape. I want it out. I set out now in a box upon the sea. Hi everybody, welcome to the Gloucester Writers Center. Um, We've got Anthony here today with his book, Land of Later On. It's a book that I have some considerable familiarity with, having read it in several of its iterations on the way to its final form. And it continues to surprise and um, delight me. Surprised me because um, it's a book that involves uh, two terminal illnesses and two suicide attempts. and. I find myself continually wondering how the hell he's going to get out of this one. Um, and delights me because he does, which I can only ascribe to the um, power of art, the power of literature, the power of good writing. And um, Anthony's going to give you some of that right now. Anthony Weller. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I can do worse than read you the uh, very succinct, because I wrote it myself, uh, compression of the book off the back cover. Um, the, the one thing, it, it sounds terribly depressing. It's actually a very funny book. I, I um, you know, Many of you are friends, or if not friends, friends of friends. It, it won't be um, mysterious to you where the apparent original impulse for this book came from. All I can say is that uh, when I started it, I was determined to make it uh, a funny book about suicide. I'd had the idea for an odyssey through the afterlife for decades, but I could never figure out um, more than that. And then I got sick, and um, I would defy anybody, no matter how happily married or stable, to have a serious neurological illness and not contemplate at least the question of suicide, even if you would never do it yourself, um, whether you're happy at home or because you're wondering what Greg's bringing for lunch <laughs> tomorrow. Um, you, the, the idea still crosses your mind. And for me, suddenly, it gave me the solution to all kinds of plot problems that I'd never been able to solve for all the decades I'd had this vague notion of a journey through the afterlife as a novel. So um, in any event, let me read you this description of the book. And then what I'll do is um, I'll read you an abbreviated version of chapter one, an extraordinarily abbreviated version of chapter two, and uh, a much later chapter. Um, Kip, a New York jazz pianist, whose career was cut short by a neurological disease, returns from a failed suicide attempt with a vivid, detailed memory of his journey through the afterlife, resembling the world as he knows it, but unlimited in space and time. It's unlike any eternity he has contemplated. Its residents are those who choose not to reincarnate, which would erase all memory of who they once were. Kip has a quest to find his beloved Lucy, a yoga teacher who shared his apartment for years, but died of leukemia before he took his own life. Is she still here? Has she waited for him or gone back to become someone else? In his odyssey across centuries and locales, Istanbul to the Marquesas Islands, India to Oklahoma and New Guinea, to find her, Kip is guided by Walt Whitman, 
who urges him to write this memoir on his return. So here's chapter one, or most of chapter one, which is called Hello and Goodbye. I don't expect to be believed. I certainly don't expect to be understood. Of all the voyages of discovery that men have survived, mine is the most distant, the most accidentally courageous, and also the most far-fetched. So I'm not counting on a medal. Still, if you ever commit suicide on a hot July afternoon in Manhattan, the question of an afterlife is bound to come up. Even if you carry zero hope of tracking down a woman who died four years earlier on the same day. One truism of a travelogue is we never question whether the author's actually been someplace. In the old days, you could invent a journey to Patagonia, complete with men whose heads grew below their shoulders. And if you had a talent for tall stories, the public was none the wiser. Then one day the guidebooks sprang up like buttercups and everywhere was ruined. The land of later on, as its residents call it, is far from ruined and you're headed there whether you like it or not and whether you believe in it or not, since you're going to die. Don't worry, that's the good news. The best news is I plan to arrive ahead of you. It wasn't my choice, only my rotten luck and a heartbreak that I was yanked back. And as soon as I'm done writing, I'm going to light out for that territory once again. The why isn't complicated, though I'm young, 48. My body is far from young, racked by one of those neurological diseases that always happen to someone else, and which are such a challenge to people's politeness when they pass you on the street. Relatively speaking, it isn't suffering to limp jerkily along with a cane or rolling walker, but otherwise look undisfigured. However, in the last few years, my right hand had given up the ability to play the piano, which was my profession. The Lucy I shared my life with, whose love and contrary humor kept me going, had died. I'd lost all determination to stick around, much <coughs> less drag myself across the pavement without falling. My body had unraveled. I had every reason to think this would get steadily worse until I was forced to give up my tiny white walk up and enter a charitable assisted living facility. The other scenario, according to my statistics-minded doctor, was that my disease, which sneered at drugs, would devour me horrifically. Either way, while it was still in my power to decide, I wanted out. Plus, I now had virtually no money left, and that nothing was worth half it was, half what it was a year before. I'm sure you know what I mean. The fact that many of us were in the same leaky boat didn't prevent the waters from rising. Shortly after I arrived in the afterlife, I was offered a guidebook to the place, covered in red leatherette, as if the musty edition contained all I'd ever need, with plenty of sensible advice that turned out not to be true. Everyone, I soon realized, has handed the same malarkey Lucy's term, by the way. For reasons I'll explain later when I returned here against my will, kicking, gasping, alive again, and able to remember it all, I managed to carry the insidious thing back with me. I've written this to tell what happened to me and make it clear what humanity is up against. The worst fate would be for you when the moment comes for your own copy to swallow its cunning words as gospel. Happiness, of course, lies behind every travel manual ever written, implying that if you go somewhere, you'll wind up content. I'm here to warn you that the guidebook you'll be given should not be trusted. I promise that where you're going will prove more lustrous and diverse than what my mother called 
the land of the living. Yet happiness depends on the decisions you make soon after arrival. Make the wrong choices and you'll find yourself scammed. Hastily reborn, shipwrecked in the wrong place at the wrong time. Though writing an anti-guidebook was never my idea, my hope is still to save you from cataclysmic errors. If I can't convince you of the destination that awaits you on leaving this life, then I guess it's my fault, but it's your funeral. I was lucky enough to encounter a stranger who befriended me and made my search for Lucy possible. Without him, I'd never have grasped the vast conspiracy in the land of later on, subtler, more perilous than any serpentine guidebook. Many earthbound psychologists would argue that every journey down deep is an allegory for the trip we all eventually must take. This idea does not begin to provide the strategic help you'll need. I will, as Lucy said, stay with me. So let me read you an extremely truncated version of chapter two. Chapter two is called Arrival and starts with a brief excerpt from the, um, from the evil guidebook. And throughout the novel, some chapters start with excerpts from this guidebook, which Kip usually um, demolishes. But he, he includes them just to show you how um, misleading it is. And you'll see it's written in a kind of um, late 19th, early 20th century uh, German guidebook style, like a Baedeker or something. Though travelers seldom stay long, this guidebook will prove indispensable. At entry, no passports are required, and customs formalities are lenient, as luggage is never forwarded. <laughs> In crossing the frontier, a small supply of tobacco is allowed, there is no duty on cigars. Passports? Customs? Luggage? Cigars? Are they kidding? The problem is that by the time you read this, you're already there and it's too late to pack an overnight bag. Some people find the paradox quaint. Not surprisingly, travelers are anxious about this stage. Will it hurt? Well, no. Will it take long? Nope. A swath of infinite blackness, then you're through to the other side in one enormous exhalation. <clears throat> but because everyone's minds are filled with claptrap from those who've had near-death experiences, they're expecting a modernist corridor straight out of a cylindrical 1960s spaceship with blinding lights and welcoming hazy figures. It's not like this. One moment you're alive, maybe struggling to breathe in a hospital bed, surrounded by impatient relatives, maybe hurrying across the road without looking both ways, maybe one more victim of a freedom fighter's bullets. The next moment, you've arrived. There's no corridor, no turnstile, no checkpoint eternity. You know exactly what's happened. You're not beset by doubts or jet lag though the initial remorse can be overwhelming. This feeling dissipates. And when your subconscious grasps the inevitable, you do relax. You know with every inch of your being that nothing can be done anymore. We've all seen those nature films of a snake swallowing a field mouse and watch the mouse, relaxed, accepting, blink out his final glimpse of sunlight as the jaws engorge him. You don't forget that sensation of farewell. You do forget the terror and the teeth. What does it look like? Well, that depends. Whoever set up the process figured out that the transition would be a lot easier if the scenery were just as you want it. 
I suppose this means some people find themselves in baggy white togas trying to balance on baggy white clouds while others get the streamlined spaceship routine. For me, it was like stepping off a Mediterranean ferry boat from decades ago as it pulled into an intimate port at twilight. The air scented with jasmine, the cafes of fizz, the lamps coming on, with a medieval fortress and craggy mountains looming. A heavenly vision I'd imagined, but never experienced. Funny, I remember thinking, so this is the afterlife. I swiftly forgot that minutes earlier, I was lying amid sweaty sheets in my apartment, waiting for all the pills I'd gobbled to take effect. Notice what I didn't think for even an instant. Am I dead? Where am I? Who are these people? Can I go back? Nor whether I was imagining things since for the first time in years, I was standing upright like a normal human being, having walked off the boat as smoothly as everyone else, without a cane. So where was Lucy? Around me a crowd strolled, enjoying a balmy breeze before dinner time. And every brown-haired woman seemed to carry hints of Lucy in her energetic walk as she strode past, not recognizing me. Each one possibly her, but not her. So uh, at this point, we're going to skip a few pages. He's welcomed by his childhood doctor. No. Uh, his childhood doctor who, of course, died when he was 10 years old. And the doctor explains various things to him about the rules. Uh, so anyway, I'll skip their conversation. But what my childhood doctor told me, plus what I came to understand later, was this. The land of later on is infinite in space and time. Its denizens are only those who choose to stay. They can occupy any place and era they like, for as long as they like. Beethoven, for example, may be found most days at his house in Vienna, circa 1820, but most evenings in the jazz clubs of 52nd Street, <laughs> circa 1943. <laughs> Though he sleeps at home, and especially since he can hear again, hates to be disturbed while hard at work. Mozart stuck around a week, long <laughs> enough to write four symphonies. <laughs> then recycled, choosing to take his chances with the next incarnation. Clearly, he should have waited before making such an irreversible decision. But most people don't want to hang around in the afterlife, particularly if they didn't enjoy retirement. Once you feel at home, you can transport yourself to anywhere or any when you want. You can set up headquarters in your idyllic little Mediterranean port and stroll out across the cobblestones of, say, 14th century Mecca or 19th century San Francisco or the airborne walkways of next century Singapore. You can have breakfast on one continent in one century and lunch on another in another. For some people, this sounds like heaven. Others never go anywhere. Why risk an unpredictable journey when you can stay home, surrounded by loved ones who died before you, while awaiting those yet to come? Death doesn't bestow a sense of adventure on people who never had one in the first place. A lot can go wrong, grievously wrong, if you don't know what you're doing. As Shakespeare murmured, no, he's not here anymore either, <laughs> though he's stuck around longer than poor Mozart, there's the rub. <laughs> Hi, Joel. Hi, Anton. So did the whole land come to you at once, or did you have to figure out the puzzle over time of how its rules work? Um, well, it, it actually did come to me pretty quickly. I, I write in a strange way now because I, 
I can't physically write. Um, I, I don't dictate to a living person. I dictate to a, um, a vengeful software. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so in any event, um, I, it, it did come pretty, pretty succinctly, but you know, I wrote this book kind of on the dare with, with myself. I'd had the idea in the vaguest possible way in one of many notebooks. I, I keep these pointless ideas in, and I'd written it down in the early 80s and never looked at it again. And there was no need to look at it because it was only a line or two long. And I'd finished a long book that um, had taken a lot out of me. And I thought, you know, because I was getting ill, um, of course now the situation Kip is in looks like a picnic to me. Did you read um, any theologians or spiritual uh, treatises, or did this all come out of your imagination? Well, I, I bought a lot of stuff, and, um, you know, in, in school, of course, I'd read Dante and Pilgrim's Progress and the usual business, and um, there was, a, a, you know, there are several books out there that by philosophers or historians of philosophy that very helpfully trace over many centuries many diverse ideas about the afterlife. And I bought all these books and then I thought this is ridiculous. You know, their guess is as good as mine. And, and if I read all this stuff, I'm not going to be able to get anywhere. So I, I, I own these books, but I, I, sorry to say, I never opened them. <laughs> um, it was called something like There Is No Heaven, and it was about five pages long. And it, it took the guy a while to get to his argument, which was that um, there couldn't be possibly be a heaven, because so many people had lived since the dawn of time, there wouldn't be room for them. There were so many holes in this argument. I mean, even his math was bad. And in a way that was liberating because he was so stupid that, uh, I mean, with, with luck he sold a lot of copies. Um, but in a, in a way it liberated me in a way that reading those complicated books would have imprisoned me. Mm -hmm. I had an aunt, or actually a great aunt, I guess, uh, who was an automatic writer, and she transcribed a whole series of stories written by a guy by the name of Frank Stockton, who was an early 1900s author who was apparently quite popular. And in the beginning, he talks about the fact that he's spending a lot of time in London now. So what you've suspected about traveling and time travel and space travel in the afterlife was exhibited in that introduction. And, and was, was when, when she was transcribing, was he already dead? Yeah, okay. Oh. Mm -hmm. That's usually what automatic writing does, doesn't it? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm so non-automatic in my writing. <laughs> but uh, that's great. So maybe I'm right. Yeah, maybe you're right. ka <laughs> <laughs> and Anthony, do we meet any uh, Gloucester denizens uh, in there? Uh, we don't. We we meet a lot of low lives though who would aspire to live here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Anthony. Um, a year or so ago, uh, you were having a dinner at Lobsterland or lunch. Uh, my wife Amanda ordered. You might. 
It was it was more than a year ago. More than a year ago? Okay. It was probably five years ago. Oh wow, my memory is. Um, she had, uh, at the time, I'd been reading um, uh, the Cuban writer Guillermo Cabrera Infante. Who was a good friend of mine. Yeah, and she mentioned that, and I hadn't thought of his stuff in relation to your writing, but hearing the, your prior, you know, I, she had told me the story, which I thought was amazing. But I hear, uh, I just finished a biography by Raymond Sousa of uh, Cabrera Infante, and I mean, I've just been kind of He was a great guy. Stuff. And uh, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that you know, knowing him and... Sure. I met him. He was in exile. He left Havana um, about five years after the revolution. He was originally behind the revolution and then rapidly got um, disenchanted with it. He was a very um, modernist, experimental writer. I fortunately met him because I was studying in, uh, I'm sure many of you know, I had a life as a musician also. And I was studying for many years with a great composer in New York City who was originally Spanish and had, after this, to um, follow some of the century's great upheavals, just trying to find a quiet place to work. <laughs> and um, he was a, a magnificent, composer named Julian Orbon who came through New York and came over one afternoon for sort of endless coffee and chat and Cabrera Infante was um, uh, he had a kind of um, illness I suppose that he could not resist making puns in three languages, in English, French, and Spanish. When I asked him for a blurb for my first novel, meaning the publisher sent him the galleys, he said, oh, you want to turn me into a galley slave? And um, one of the problems in his translations was translating, you know, multi-level puns in Spanish into multi-level puns in English or French. And he was, of course, the bane of his translators. <laughs> and they would do their best, and then he would sort of seize the, the manuscript and rewrite it for them. Um, and, uh, for example, the book you referred to is Infante's Inferno, was uh, originally, there's a famous piece by Ravel called, in English, Pavan for a Dead Princess. In French, it's, or in Spanish, it's Pavana para un infante defunta. Is that right? And book, the book is a love letter to the Havana that no longer existed. And of course, Infante's name was Cabrera Infante. In Spanish, the book is Havana para un infante defunta. In other words, Havana written by a fallen infante. And, you know, he would go absolutely crazy trying to find equivalents in another language for all these puns. <laughs> and um, I, rem I remember I drove him, I annoyed him slightly because his famous book was called Three Trap Tigers. In Spanish, that's Tres Tristes Tigres. I said it should have been Three Tearful Tigers. But in any event, um, he was a man of tremendous enthusiasm. And uh, when it came time to, to bug him for my first novel, which was about a Cuban, I knew that if he gave me a blurb, then nobody would be able to criticize me for not having gotten the Cuban bit right. <laughs> and sure enough, he came, came through right away. Um, but sometime we can have coffee and I'll tell you lots of Cabrera and Fonte stories. That would be great, Anthony. Thank you so much. Hi, Joel. Hi, Anton. So did the whole land...
come to you at once, or did you have to figure out the puzzle over time of how its rules work? Um, well, it, it actually did come to me pretty quickly. I, I write in a strange way now because I, I can't physically write.